What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome on in to episode two of Spotlight right here, part of the Brass Ring Media family. It is Wednesday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody out there, and thanks for being here live. Thanks for joining me. I'm Zach Haydorn, your host, and you've come to the right place for in-depth and deep analysis into one current event topic in professional wrestling the spotlight on one topic and today um is a really really good one i'm uh, really excited to kind of do this do this show and talk with you um about this guy because i think uh for the next few weeks um especially as AEW has some really big events um coming up um I think this guy's name is going to be a, a lot of places. It already is, um, but uh, as AEW pumps out some big shows in March, um, this gentleman is going to make waves, I think, in in, uh, in a lot of different ways. And so the spotlight today is on Kazuchika Okada. Why? Well, the rumor mill has been churning for quite some time um, that Okada – is uh, not only going to be leaving New Japan, he, of course, confirmed that um, and wrapped up with the company this past weekend um, at the New Beginning events, which was a really touching, um, just a really touching moment for for him and for the company and for the fans. Like, I thought, you know, Okada is such a interesting performer. And, you know, someday I hope that there's like a, like a, a, a long, long, long book written about the guy because he just seems to be so professional, so buttoned up, so in tune um, kind of with his own presence and his own role in professional wrestling, but also with what the fans want to do and what the fans uh, think of him. And, and, and just he's got a good pulse on, on the industry. And so it was really, really fun to watch him take on um, Hiroshi Tanahashi. We'll get into that in a little bit um, over this past weekend. And then have that moment with the fans in the ring in New Japan um, as he departs for his next professional challenge um, in his career. So Okada announced that he was leaving New Japan in January. And um, since that time, the rumor mill has been, as I said, (laughs) Churning, sure <laughs> you know, uh, Okada's, you know, constantly been in the conversation of potential WWE plans. Maybe he's going to be in the Royal Rumble. Maybe he's not. Who knows? And then of course, there's an AEW connection uh, to Okada already, uh, thanks to the partnership AEW has with New Japan. And so when he announced that, hey, he's leaving New Japan, those two companies really made the most sense unless he's going to be retiring uh th- those two companies specifically made the most sense as the companies to watch and companies to monitor uh that would try to get um okada services i mean th- look there i think it's fun to think about okada doing a run on the indies here in the states i think it's there's there's some potential these days with him to do some work in impact wrestling but the bottom line is okada is a Big time star, premier level star, top five wrestler in the world today, period. So, you know, he, he's not going to leave New Japan and go to a situation where, you know, the money's not there or the, you know, the, 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 the push isn't there. The spotlight <laughs> isn't there. Uh, man, I've been planning that one for weeks. Um, he's just not going to, not going to do that. So, Really, the only two places that you can look for or look at in terms of uh, companies that can sign Okada that makes sense for him are WWE and AEW. And so the rumor mill has been churning since then, since he announced it. Different reports indicate and have indicated um, that he's going to WWE, that he would start in NXT. Um, And then, of course, this past weekend, um, Fightful reporting that Okada will be signing with AEW. And uh, <laughs> and is likely to debut um, in March. So there you have it. Like that's the landscape right now for Okada. Um, and I want to break that down because I think it's really interesting. We talked a little bit about 
Okada in AEW and about Okada in WWE yesterday on uh, the Brass Ring Media flagship show with uh, with Tyler Sage and myself. Um, but I want to dive deeper into those topics and into Okada as a star and his potential as a star um, here in the United States. But we'll set the table um, first and then we'll dig right into all of that great stuff and we'll take your um, take your thoughts, your comments, your questions um, along the way as well. This is the Brass Ring Media Podcast Spotlight. Uh, we are live right here every single Wednesday afternoon, 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 Central, spotlighting one topic in professional wrestling, a topic that's in the news, a topic that is uh, current event based. Today it's Okada. Last week, if you want to go back and check out last week's show, it was all about Roman Reigns. And man, what a what a week! What a week that guy had. If I would have known uh, <laughs> what was on tap for Roman Reigns at uh, at the WrestleMania press conference last Thursday, I probably would have held off <laughs> and done the Roman Reigns show this week to get into some of that stuff. But luckily, we spent a ton of time talking about that on other Brass Ring Media podcasts. And you can check out all of our work, our slate of free podcasts Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday all live just by subscribing to our YouTube channel. It is free and you get all that content immediately as soon as you hit the subscribe button. Uh, make sure that you uh, hit notifications so you know when we go live. We're live Mondays, 3 Eastern with Tyler Sage and Monday Mania. Our flagship show, the first one of the week, is on Tuesday nights at 9 Eastern. Wednesday, 3 Eastern is this show Spotlight. We're back Thursday at 3 Eastern for... Uh, uh, for another Brass Ring Media uh, flagship show. And then Thursday night, Robert Vallejos hangs out with the Night Owls with Nocturnal Knockout, 10 Eastern, um, spending uh, spending time late night going over the news a week in wrestling in a very uh, kind of sports talk radio type format. If you missed any of those shows, it's, on, it's all on our YouTube channel right now, um, and you can check it out for free um, by just uh, subscribing. What about Friday, says the chat, says Ryan in the chat. Hey, we're working on it. We will be live five days a week at some point, my friend. And we are uh, we are working on that next slot. So bear with us <laughs> on that. Um, Ryan, thanks for joining us live. Tracy's in the chat. Thanks for joining us live. Thanks to everybody who has watched this on demand. If you like what we do and you like how we cover um, the professional wrestling business, Find us on Patreon, patreon.com backslash Brass Ring Media. Uh, become a member, support what we're doing, and I uh, and I think you'll be really happy with all that you get back um, as, uh, as a member. It's a free member podcast once a week, access to all of our post-pay-per-view and post-PLE review shows, access to our Discord community, and full access to all of our written work, um, all of our written work at uh, on Substack. Our Substack newsletter is uh, is available to members as well. It's four dollars, you guys. We'd love to have you. We will do all we can to earn your business, and uh, you can become a member now. Patreon.com backslash Brass Ring Media. <laughs> Ryan, messing with me. The name of the book is stunning. It's not available yet. It's going to be printing really soon. More information to come on that. But I figure tease tease everybody here. Look at that. Just with the swerve of a chair, I get uh, to show <laughs> to show that off. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for the uh, the cue on the, the free plug of the book. Super excited for that to come out. Okay. The Super Chats are open, you guys. If you want to get in on the action here and talk a little Okada, uh, I'll read all your comments. Take all your questions. Drop them in there. Uh, we certainly would appreciate it. They help the show. They help Rastering Media grow. And uh, we certainly appreciate any contribution you can make. So thank you in advance. Now back to Okada. First things first, before we talk about, you know, his, his like WWE impact, the potential he could have there, potential impact that he could and has already had um, in AEW, I want to spend a minute and maybe more than a minute <laughs> talking about, um, talking about the New Japan run that Okada just wrapped up. I mean, this run that he had is historic in nature. Like, it, it's a run that really 
helped save the company. And Tanahashi, you know, had played a big part in kind of the rebirth of, of New Japan. Um, but Okada did too. I mean, he really, that company was strapped to his back um, for quite some time. And he spent much of his time in New Japan as the top guy. He spent much of his time in New Japan as the, the world champion. I mean, like he, he's really synonymous with, like the rebirth of of that company and for that company getting um, as hot as it did in 2014, 2015, 2016, and, 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 you know, kind of up until like the pandemic there where things cooled off a little bit. Um, that's, a, that's Okada. That's on the shoulders of Okada and on the major, major feuds that, um, that he had. And, you know, Okada developed in the, um, in New Japan system. I mean, he's very much a New Japan guy. And so I think it's really um, interesting to follow that career. I mean, look at look at these the top matches that he's top top feuds that he's had and and multiple, you know, premier level main events all across uh, New Japan shows all throughout the year. He's had his running with Tanahashi, multiple Wrestle Kingdom um, <clears throat> uh, matches there. Of course, we know the classics that he's had with Kenny Omega, you know, Wrestle Kingdom, Dominion, the G1 um, matches that they've had. Just some wonderful work from an in-ring perspective and from just like a work rate perspective, but also just big business for, for New Japan too. Like, you know, again, like those matches and, and the Tanahashi matches too, you know, that those also were similar in nature in terms of creating buzz for the company. I mean, you know, those Tanahashi matches, the, the Wrestle Kingdom match was a five-star Dave Meltzer match. And that came at a time when there weren't that many five-star matches being doled out by Dave Meltzer. And look, I don't want to have the star rating <laughs> argument. It's uh, subjective, right, to everybody. I put out my ratings after pay-per-views. He puts out his. We don't agree. But – at that time, there weren't a lot of people doing that type of reporting. And Dave's ratings were kind of the, the gospel in terms of matches that you must go out of your way to see. And the Okada-Tanahashi match, um, I remember hearing about that before I was really like kind of tapped into New Japan. It was one of the matches that got me hooked on New Japan was, was, those, was that series of matches and the match they had at, at Wrestle Kingdom. And I mean, it's such a it's such an important match for for that reason in terms of it not just being a good match and not just being a feud, but being a feud that attracted more eyes, new eyes. Like, and that I think is what Okada is synonymous with in a lot of ways. He kind of brought some new eyes to the New Japan product and then held on to them as he continued to have his run. So that those Tanahashi matches, the the Kenny Omega matches, same type of impact, same type of impact. Five star match, Wrestle Kingdom, Omega in the main event of uh, of the biggest show of the year, sixty minutes, sixty minutes. I mean, that match is epic, and and I think everybody will talk about the Dominion match that Omega had with Okada, and the, the two out of three falls, and it's it's. I mean, it's just a it's just a work of art. I mean, it is a it's a masterpiece in every in every way. Uh, but and I and I and I think that I liked that match best. It's one of the, I think the best one of the best wrestling matches ever. Um, but there's a special place in history for that first um, the first Okada Omega match that took place at at um, at Wrestle Kingdom. That was I think. You know, you can't, it's hard to look back on it with in the light that I'm about to look back on it on because it has uh, all those guys have just had such a crazy run since then. But at that time, like there was, you know, apprehension about whether or not that match could like deliver as good as it, as it did. It, you know, can Kenny Omega be in the main event of a Wrestle Kingdom show? And man, I mean, obviously <laughs> the answer was yes to that. Um, but you know, it, it, it wasn't like uh, a given like it would be today if Okada and Omega wrestle again. It was not a given back when they when they had that match initially. So, you know, 
it's a it's an important match again for the trajectory of New Japan. But really, you know, bigger picture, like it it, it set the table for you know what we know now as AW. You know, I mean, like that match commanded a lot of attention. Kenny Omega had um, had eyes in the United States. Bullet Club was a major, major faction, you know, worldwide at that point in time. That was kind of like the hot, a hot era for them where they began to to transcend wrestling. Bullet Club shirts ended up, you know, in a hot topic. Like it was the beginning of of all of that kind of happening and all of that coming together and the and the recognition of, hey, you know, there is space for another, you know, national competitor to WWE competitor. I don't mean to put the air quotes up. I'm not trying to be a jerk, but, you know, let's call it spade a spade. And, you know, look, Okada's there for that. He's the other dance partner with Omega there, you know? I mean, that's important. You keep going. He had matches with Shinsuke Nakamura. Will Ospreay. My goodness. I mean, those guys incredible feud an incredible series of matches all around and all sorts of different events whether it's the g1 whether it's um uh, wrestle kingdom you know um new japan cup they had some some really good inter- like really good matches there too like another top feud um naito is a big one multiple um multiple wrestle kingdom main events three of them Three Wrestle Kingdom main event matches. So that has history and, and deep roots. Um, and countless others, you know, countless others that Okada has worked with. And I think, you know, that to me is what made him so special in New Japan. Is like you put him in there with anybody. Bronson Reed, you know, the uh, Jonah back in the G1 a few years ago. You know, that was a great match. And like... Who would have thought that was a great match? Like Jonah's not, you know, a different kind of worker than Kenny Omega. He's a different kind of worker than, you know, Tanahashi and Will Ospreay. So what kind of match can, you know, can Okada get out of him? Well, <laughs> a really, really good match. A really, really good match. And I think that's the tale of Okada. Good business, pop, you know, insanely popular among the Japanese fans, but can work with anybody. And I think that's like a major, major key of being a top star is that you can work with them all. And Okada certainly did in in New Japan. So that run that he had can't go, it can't go overstated or understated just how important it was to really like the wrestling industry period. And I mean, certainly Japanese wrestling, but more than that, more than that, I mean, Okada's run at the top helped New Japan expand to other markets expand to the United States, you know, um, they have like a footprint here now that probably doesn't happen without Okada as the top guy and Okada having the matches that he had and those matches creating the buzz that they did. So he is an incredibly important talent and now he's a free agent. But before we talk about that, I want everybody who's listening live, drop in the chat your favorite Okada match. I mean, I think it'll be fun to kind of relive some of this. I'm assuming we're going to get a lot of Tanahashi. I'm assuming we're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of Kenny Omega. Um, Will Ospreay, I guess, as we get uh, a lot of that. But are there any Dark Horse candidates out there? Let me know in the chat. Super pumped to uh, to kind of see where you guys are at on uh, – on the best Okada matches, Ryan uh, jumping in here. Meltzer can't carry Z hate or jock strap. That's right. Ha ha ha, Dave. <laughs> Appreciate you, Ryan. Thank you. Um, so now Okada's a free agent. And it, I like, I don't know about you guys, and you can drop this in the chat as well. Like, like what what is the goal of Okada's free agency? And I think this is like a legitimate topic. And I think it's telling, you know, where he chooses to go, where he chooses to work. Um, Because the goal could be a lot of things. It's, okay, I'm 38 or 36 or whatever I am. And uh, I can't work the New Japan style forever. So I want to go to a company that can, where I can still wrestle. I can still have good matches. I can make a lot of money. um, But I don't necessarily have to work that, that, new japan style right okay i think that you know you can achieve that in both wwe and in AEW. um 
but maybe he doesn't want to have like those crazy matches anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that New Japan style takes it out of you. I mean, it's strong style. It's called that for a reason. And so maybe he's just like, Hey, I just, you know, I want to be like Shinsuke Nakamura where I just kind of go to WWE and make a big check. I do what they want me to do. And that's, and that's, that's that. So, you know, <laughs> and so, you know, just, eh, okay, I'm just going to do that. You know, Nakamura had that kind of a run. You know, he had that great match with Sami Zayn and made a huge, you know, a huge um, kind of splash in terms of debuting in, in NXT. Uh, but then, like, you know, it fizzled after that. Some of that's on the booking. A lot of it's on Vince McMahon. Um, but, you know, it's on Nakamura, too. So maybe Okada wants that. Um, maybe he wants to just show he can work in a different company and he can be a top star in a different company. Um, maybe he has aspirations to be just the single biggest and most popular wrestler in the entire world, bar none. Okay. Well, there's a landing spot for that. So we don't really know kind of what his main goal is. I mean, I think, you know, obviously it's money. Um, it's a job, it's a business. So of course that's going to be a primary thing, but you know, I, I think WWE and AEW would both offer Okada like a lot of money to come. Um, obviously one would out, will outbid the other, but I, I don't think money is going to be like a st necessarily a sticking point because he's got leverage. He's got two companies got, that were kind of pining for pining for his services, so to speak. So you know, I don't think money's the thing. So what's the goal of the free agency? And I don't know. There's been no reporting on that. We don't know kind of what the idea is um, for Okada one way or the other. But I think where he lands will tell you um, a little bit about what he's looking um, to get out of this next part of his um, his professional career. Um, Okada's a star. Okada is a big big star in, in Japan and for the pro wrestling diehards, the people who, like me and like you and like, you know, that, that follow the wrestling industry know who Okada is. There are people at my day job who watch AEW who have no idea who Okada is, you know? And so the idea of like being a big star I think is important to kind of breaking down what and where Okada fits best next. Um, because, you know, he, he, he's not just going to walk into AEW or WWE and immediately have this just incredible impact. I mean, we've already seen that in AEW, right? I mean, we've already seen Okada on AEW TV. We've seen him, you know, on, AW pay-per-views, the forbidden doors. Like, and and it's been interesting. It's been fun to watch. The matches with Brian Danielson have been excellent. You know, that's the, no argument there. But he hasn't been um, you know, a needle mover as far as like, whoa, Okada's gonna be on TV, we gotta watch, and now that does 200,000 more buys or a hundred thousand more buys. That we have not been able to make that connection with Okada yet to being on television in the United States. Now, AEW hasn't really promoted him in that way. And I think that is something that if you're concerned about AEW winning the Okada sweepstakes, and according to Sean Ross Sapp at Fightful, they have, um, you have to promote him. And you have to make him your, a big star. You have to sh showcase him as a big star. It, it really, you can't have another run at him like you did when he first came in, which is just, ah, oh, you, the people here know him. Not all of them do. And it's one thing if they're going to just come in for like a special one-off appearance, one-off forbidden door appearance. Okay. You know, let's just, let's just get through it. The people who order the pay-per-view are going to, you know, are, are huge fans of new Japan anyway. And so we're just going to get there. Well, that that narrative changes when Okada be, becomes an actual part of your roster. You need to turn him into a star here. 
And it's not just, oh, he's a good wrestler. So, you know, people are going to like him. No, like you got to promote him. You got to promote him like WWE is promoting Cody Rhodes now. And obviously you don't have that same mouthpiece. You don't have the same footprint. You don't have, you know, the same volume that WWE does in that regard. But, you know, they have their own way. They have their own, you know, mechanisms to create stars or they should. And if they don't, that's a different problem. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the same problem, but it's a, a bigger issue than just one guy, than just Okada. But my point in all of this is, like, if you want, if, if, if Okada is going to be a needle mover in the States on television weekly or bi-weekly or whatever it's going to be, he has to be presented as a, as a star, as a, important. And this can't be a thing where like, you know, he starts off at the bottom where he's going to feud in AEW with, with dark order or in WWE, he's going to feud with like, you know, Bobby Lashley to start off. Like, no, like that's in either, in either scenario that, you know, it doesn't work for the Okada brand and what, and really what he does best, which is present as a star. I mean, look at that guy. Like he looks like a star professional wrestler. He's got swagger. He's got confidence. The physique is there. Um, he's got just a natural charisma about him. Like you need to capitalize on all those things. And so that to me, you know, whoever ends up getting Okada, and it looks as if right now it is going to be AEW. I do trust that report from uh, from Fightful and from Sean Ross Sapp. And so if that is the case, the the big the big issue for Tony Khan or the big challenge is how do we feature him as a big star, the biggest star that we have? Okay. How do we do that? Is it a vignette? That's probably too simple. Is it multiple vignettes? Okay. That's, that's good. But really it's deciding he's going to be a top guy and booking him that way. Top level matches right away, not Jay White treatment, but treatment of somebody that we haven't seen in AEW yet. You come in, you wrestle for the world title and you win the world title right away. You know, to show everybody that like, hey, this guy's a top guy, he's a premier guy, not just in Japan, but look what he did here too. He just rolled the roster. He beat everybody and now he's the champion. And then you go from there. Like I think that's the kind of impact that he has to have. Same thing in WWE. You know, if the if the if the SRS report is incorrect and the other report is okay, same rule applies. You know, in WWE, I think he's better positioned to um, to feature stars and to create stars in the way that you need Okada to be a star. But the same rule doesn't apply. Like you have to present him in a way that comes across as a really big deal. So this isn't feuding with Bobby Lashley. This isn't. I mean, obviously, this isn't palling around backstage with, you know, um, with our truth or Chad Gable or, or you know, or, or those guys. Like, it's not that. Like, it's, you know, answering some kind of open challenge for Randy Orton and beating Randy Orton. You know, and you know, then moving on to, um, to somebody like, you know, I don't know, like like uh, AJ Styles. You know, and having like a classic with him, eventually having a showdown with Roman Reigns, having a showdown with Cody Rhodes, Drew McIntyre, you know, working those guys and winning. That's, I think, how you, how Okada would need to be presented to really be the star that both of the companies um, would want him to be. And, and, and that's, that's, you know, it's not just in the interest of, uh, of each company to do so, but it's in Okada's interest too. Like that guy's gimmick. You know, it, it's it's about being the best. It revolves around that one simple point. You know, he doesn't have a lot of flat. I mean, he's flashy, but he's not. You know, he's not very gimmicky. Like he's very much like a straightforward pro wrestler, a top level pro wrestler. Which is, I'm the best, and I'm the champion. And when he's not the champion, I'm the best, and I'm going after the championship. Like that's the Okada formula that we've seen work. So. You know, it, it, it'd be strange to see him in another role. And I, I think you can, in both companies, you could define him down really quick by taking that idea of I'm the best um, away from him. That's how he 
comes across as the star that he is. That's the psychology behind that character. And so you can't, you absolutely can't take that away. Um, real interested to see what, uh, what everybody says as far as where they want um, Okada to sign. I mean, I think that there's kind of like an interesting split going on here, WWE versus AEW. And we'll start off this next portion of the show talking about potential Okada opponents and what Okada could bring out in his potential opponents with a super chat from Tracy, a big supporter of the show, Brass Ring Media member, um, one of the Brass Ring Media member originals. Um, so Tracy, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for helping out the show and for being a part of Brass Ring Media. Uh, Tracy says, who do you think he can work with that would be amazing and surprising at the same time? This is an awesome question. Um, <laughs> great question. Now, I've got I've got a list of, um, of, of, of potential opponents for Okada that I made before the show here. Um, and I'm going to read that list, and then I'm going to get back to Tracy's question. So the list is, in WWE, Roman Reigns, Cody, CM Punk, Randy Orton, AJ Styles, Finn Balor, Damian Priest, Drew McIntyre. In AEW, MJF, Adam Page, Adam Cole, Jay White, Will Ospreay, John Moxley, and Adam Copeland. So we're going to talk about all those opponents here in a minute. But here's the deal. I don't think I can use any of those names to you know, to answer um, Tracy's question here, because none of those names are really surprising. I, I guess that's um, my, my point in reading those collectively. Those are all names that it would be amazing to see work with Okada, but none of them really, I would put in the surprising bucket. I mean, I think that if he signed with AEW, those are the matches that you want him to have over the course of two, two years, two, three years. If those, if you sign with WWE, those are the opponents that you'd want to see him take on um, throughout his, you know, his WWE run of three years or four years or whatever. So no, no big surprises there. In terms of a surprising talent that that Okada could work with upon coming over, I, man, I mean, it's it's, I mean, Gunther is an opponent that I think would be tremendous to see. But now that I think of him, you know, and, and Seth Rollins too. Like I left both those off the list initially, but both those guys I think are guys that um, could have really good, amazing matches with Okada. Uh, but again, not surprising. So I'm trying to like try to dig deeper here on a potential, you know, surprising talent that could uh, that could have a good that could have a really good match with Okada. And I guess where I'm landing on this, and and there, you guys might push back. Those in the chat, go ahead and push back. But I would say, and I would get the pushback of, oh, it, this is not that surprising. But I think it qualifies as surprising. And that would be um, Kanosuke Takeshita. I think that match would just be like, just a lethal, <laughs> just a lethal match. Like those two just would beat the tar out of each other. And they're both so crisp in the ring. They're both so clean with their moves and their strikes and their intensity and they hit hard and they're aggressive. Um, in a lot of ways, Takeshita is a, is a young Okada, like with more like size and he's a little bit bulkier, but man, the way that he attacks those moves and the way he bumps and the way he sells um, and really what he's willing to do in the ring. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty damn impressive. So that would be kind of my uh, surprising uh, opponent for Okada that could really bring out, you know, a really fun side of uh, fun side of him. And, and I, honestly, Okada could, you know, really do a lot for for Takeshita too. I mean, man, I mean Takeshita has already proven that he can have classic matches with just about anybody. Um, put him in there with a guy like Okada, and I think you really, uh, you know, you really. Uh, you really, you really have something. Um, on, on the other end of the spectrum, though, in terms of surprising, I'd, you know, I'd like to see what Okada could do in like a WWE environment with like, you know, <clears throat> with somebody like, um, like, like a Logan Paul or something like that, like something that's like super WWE, you know, 
and it's a and it's a good match because Logan Paul is going to be the guy that like is just a jerk to Okada, pretends he doesn't even know who he is because he's from a promotion halfway around the world, and that's like the essence of your feud. And so, like, <laughs> I'd be interested to see that play out as well. <clears throat> and you know, Logan Paul is a guy who can clearly, you know, he can work. I mean, he's got some talent, and uh, you know, Okada I think could uh, could have a fun match with him too. Totally different style, totally different type of match. Totally different type of everything, you know, but that's, that's Okada. That's what he does. So, you know, the, 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 I'd want to see both, but for, for very different reasons. Tracy, thank you for the super chat. Appreciate it. Great question. Um, the super chats are open folks. Uh, you can get them in right now if you're joining us live and I, uh, glad that you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sean popped in. Thank you, Sean. What's up? Um, so Sean is saying here in the chat that he is praying that uh, uh, that AEW does some storytelling and doesn't just have great matches. And yeah, like that's the key. I mean, that is the key, and that's what we talk about all the time with uh, uh, with um, with AEW in general. And I think Okada and anybody that's coming in, Mercedes Monet, you know, same thing. Like there has to be a story there. There has to be an avenue to make these talents into stars that draw and that's the key all right talent who can who's who has the better offering if you're okada and you're looking at the two companies that we just talked about wwe and AEW, and you're looking at the list of talent that you can work with um who are you picking where, where are you going based on just the opponents that are going to be offered to you. On one side, you have AEW. And again, I'll read the list. JF, Adam Page, Adam Cole, Jay White, Will Ospreay, John Moxley, Adam Copeland. And there are others, of course. But that's like a bit of a who's who of AEW. I'm sure I'm missing somebody important. On the WWE side, it's Roman Reigns, it's Cody Rhodes. I'll add Seth Rollins, I'll add Gunther, Randy Orton, AJ Styles, Finn Balor, Drew McIntyre. Damien Priest. Okay. Like that's kind of like my list there. So if you're Okada, like what, what appeals more to you with the AW matches? There's some big matches in there. There's some really big matches. The MJF matches big. Adam Page matches big. Um, you know, Cole, White, Osprey, they're all big in their own way. My holdup is. How much new interest can you generate with, you know, a Okada Osprey match? Like, I, I, I understand that that match is a great match on paper. And not just on paper. They've had it multiple times. And I think that's my point. Is if you want to see Will Osprey versus Okada, like, you know, I don't know. Like, like go to... New Japan world and find it, you know, I, I, the, are they going to top that match? I don't think so. Those matches are near perfect matches. And so if you do them again in a W yes, there's a huge portion of the audience that has not seen Okada and Osprey work. Okay. Can you make that match really, really interesting? Can you make that match a drawing card? Can you make that match um, mean something? More to the people that just that already know that Okada and, and Osprey can have a classic. Because if, if you're just playing to that small crowd and you, to Sean's point, you don't tell like an AEW story about Will Ospreay and Okada, then you're just leaning on the nostalgia of that match. And you're really putting it on just for the people that already know it can be good and that have already seen it. And that's where I think you don't have value. Like that is not valuable to AEW from a let's use Okada to grow our audience type thing. It's just not. It plays to the people that already know what he can do, that already have seen these top tier matches. And, and, and it goes for Jay White matches. It goes for Adam Cole matches. Um, it goes for the Kenny Omega matches that they could have in AEW. Like you can't lean on nostalgia here. And just say to yourself, okay, well, hey, you know, I, oh, everybody loved Okada and Omega. Let's do that again. 
okay, you can do it again, but you have to give it new life. You have to give it a new purpose. You have to give it a new narrative, more context, AEW context. It can't be a, oh, I just want to have that classic match under my, under my roof. Because then you really are playing to a small, small crowd and a crowd that probably is going to be disappointed in the end product because all those matches are likely going to be better in New Japan and, 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 and have already been really, really good. So that's where I stand on a lot of AEW stuff. It like Okada's success in AEW very much comes from how he's booked. It's got nothing to do with the match quality. That's going to be there. It's got nothing to do with the quality of opponent. That's going to be there. But by the time he goes toe to toe with these opponents, is that, is it going to be fresh? Are people that just watch AEW going to want to see that? And that's what, that's the goal that Tony Khan should have to have because it's a great slate of opponents. But if it's just a, you know, if it's just the greatest hits tour from, from Okada and he's just going to like redo all these matches that he's had, like, yeah, like that's going to get old pretty quick. I really think that's going to get old um, really fast. So, but the plus side of that, if you're Okada is I know how to work with all these people. (laughs) I, there's no, you know, yes, it's challenging. I'm sure. But like, Hey, this is like another day at the office for me. I I know how to work these guys. I know how to work Will Ospreay. I know how to work Kenny Omega. I know how to work Adam Page and Adam Cole. There's a familiarity there. So that's the pro is that you know all these guys. You're walking into a comfortable place. And that's that's valuable to you as a performer, as a person, as a human that's out there looking for a job. And we've we've all been there, right? It's hard to walk into a somewhere where you know nobody, right? And start to do start to do a job at a high level. It's that's difficult. Um, and he wouldn't have that in AEW. Plus, he's got a relationship in AEW already. He's worked matches, he knows Tony Khan. That's that's all there. Um on the WWE side, it's really different. It's really different and compelling for a totally different reason. You know, AEW, safe, safe choice. WWE, a little bit more risky, but I think with a higher ceiling. Working with Roman Reigns, whew, that's big time. It's a big time, different kind of match than you'd have with Will Ospreay, no doubt, but a big time match. Roman Reigns is a huge star. Cody Rhodes, same thing. You know, different kind of match, but man, just the, the he levels up from as, as a star himself working with these working with these guys. Um, CM Punk, same thing. AJ Styles, they've wrestled before, but again, in a WWE environment, I think that'd be really interesting. The match that I'd really want to see in WWE, and I know that I'm this guy, <laughs> not everybody out there agrees, but man, I, I'd love to see Okada and Randy Orton. I think that match would be like, it's just one of the purest, WWE style pro wrestling matches. And I don't mean like uh, a bunch of like holds and mat wrestling or anything like that, but I just mean like <laughs> doing as little as possible, but getting like the most out of that little bit of work. I mean, that's like the Randy Orton specialty. It's what I think is so fascinating about him as a performer is, and I've said it before, like people have told me, um, you know, on the Chicago independent scene here, like watch Randy Orton. He doesn't do all that much, but what he does is significant. Like what he does do is huge for the matches. And so I think like Okada and him could gel perfectly as far as, uh, as, <laughs> as far as that goes. I, I, you know, I really, I really do. Um, so I'm super, I'll be really excited to see, to see that match, but it's a brand new slate of opponents, people that Okada has never even thought to work with minus Cody and AJ. Right. I mean, like, you know, you never thought Roman Reigns versus Okada match could happen. Like you never thought like a, um, you know, a Roman Reigns uh, Orton match could happen. Maybe it could someday, but I mean, it's a brand new slate. It's a new world. It's a different environment. It's something totally new and totally fresh. So if you're him, you know, is that compelling in certain ways? Well, sure. You get to work with a brand new slate of talent. Is it? Is there a con in there? Definitely, <laughs> because 
it's not familiar. It's uncomfortable. It's weird. The other part of working with WWE is you just don't know how you're going to be presented. You know, it could be all good one day when you're getting, you know, pitched on this, but you know, then it's WWE and they don't have a good track record right now of, um, uh, of presenting Japanese talent in the, in the best way, you know, Nakamura just turned a corner, but you know, he's been there since, you know, 2017, <laughs> you know, Asuka has had some really big matches and she's won championships, but um, you know, like her booking has been back and forth and she's been as low on the card as like jobber level, you know, kind of, um, you know, a barrier talent to the, to the upper part of the card. And then she's been at the upper part of the card. So, I mean, like there's a wide range there, but I don't think that you think of Asuka as a, you know, top star, like you do Charlotte, like you do Becky, like you did Mercedes, um, you know, I don't like, like Bianca right now. I don't think she's on that level and never has been. Um, so, you know, there's that for him to consider, but it's a really like, I just, I wanted to call that out because it goes back to like our central thesis here, which is what does Okada want out of free agency? Does he want just to, you know, do his thing and be comfortable and work with who he wants to work with? do what he wants to do, have a little bit more freedom, still make a lot of money. Okay. If that's the case, you probably want to go to AW. If you want to definitively solidify yourself as the best wrestler in the world period for the biggest wrestling promotion in the world period, um, you got to go to WWE. I mean, that's the more intriguing move. That's the freshest move. There's talent there that are the top stars in the world that you'd want to work with if, if you're Okada. But that comes with with different baggage too. So it comes down to like what kind of free agency that he that he wants to have. Um, we'll wrap up on this note, and it's it's more of a question that I want to kind of analyze out loud with you guys. Um, can he be in an episodic? Like, can he be successful in an episodic environment? You know. That, I think, aside from the talent, right, two totally different talent pools. If you're Okada and you're coming into WWE or AEW and you're making that decision, totally different. What's similar about the two companies that we don't know about Okada yet is the fact that they're both episodic in nature. 52 weeks a year. (laughs) Shows. And maybe he's not going to be on every show, but it's a different cadence it's a different pattern than new japan shows where new japan goes on tour and they you know they have certain big shows in certain spots um they do the g1 they've got the new japan cup and then you know then you know that is what it is but it's not episodic it's not you know storytelling in an episodic way it's it's way more sports like it's way it's it's harder work but it's less it's less dates um so he has to be able to fit in that environment too, in that, like just the reality of the schedule and what the Okada character would be asked to do. Um, it's way different than what he's done before. And my answer is hell yes, he could be successful. Like absolutely he could be. I mean, I think nine times out of 10 top stars in pro wrestling are top stars in pro wrestling. And they deliver regardless of like what the situation is, as long as they're booked, as long as they're booked right and they can deliver in the ring and on the microphone and all that, like top stars are going to do top star things. And so I absolutely think he can be, um, you know, he can be a player in that environment. He needs, as I said before, the booking to be on his side. And he may, I don't know. He, we talked about this a lot yesterday on the flagship. So I won't do too much here. If you want to hear kind of like an in-depth discussion on, on this next topic, like, I encourage you to watch that show or watch the end at least <laughs> watch the whole thing, but watch the end at least because that's when we, when we did, when we discussed it, um, you know, does Okada need a manager in either environment so that he can stay in those stories, even when he can't speak great English, I would argue, no, he doesn't because I think part of the Okada charm and part of the Okada star power is, you know, his charisma. And I think you, 
You don't see that if he's hiding behind a mouthpiece or a manager that can talk for him. So I think you, you want somebody who can translate. You want somebody on commentary who can tell the audience and the people at home what he's saying, but you really want to make it comfortable for him where he can just be him and be him at the top level. And I think if you do that, it doesn't matter what language he speaks. He is a premier star, premier talent, I should say. And you got to put him in a place where he can succeed. And so I think he can succeed um, in, in a, in, in an episodic environment. I, I, I really, uh, I really think, I really think he can. We'll wrap up there guys. I can't wait to see where this goes. I can't wait to see when this happens. Is it going to be a big business? How would a debut happen in AEW? Is it going to be that he maybe, you know, takes Adam Copeland up on the Cope open and you get Copeland versus, uh, versus Okada right out of the gate at some point. That'd be, that'd be pretty damn cool. I mean, that'd be really cool. Um, I, I, yeah, I could hear, sit here and come up with some different ideas about WWE and how they could debut there, but I still think that's going to happen at this point based on what we've seen and what we've heard and what's been reported. So it's like, keep a lookout on AEW because the, the bottom line here is AEW most likely and WWE, if they swoop in at the last minute or he's not already signed, though that company, AEW is getting a premier level wrestler in his prime. And yes, there's some mileage on the body. He's, you know, taking a beating in, in, uh, in New Japan. But, you know, any 36-year-old wrestler at this point in their career, if they're doing it at a high level, have, has taken their lumps for sure. No question. Um, it may be a little bit more pronounced with Okada because, again, that, that Japanese style is tough. Um, but regardless, you're getting this top international star. And like the business of that is, 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 is huge. You know, if you're AW, you know, winning over Okada is, is major. It's a major get, you know, um, it's an ironic get because you're kind of stealing from your, your partner there, but Hey, Okada's out of contract and you know, you, he decides what he wants to do. Um, so it's rare that these types of talents become available and, just you, when you look back at the career Okada had, it is historic to this point. And he's a legendary figure in professional wrestling as an industry, not just in New Japan, but as an industry and what he's done for the industry. And now he's available for another company to get. And it's going to be the upstart. It's going to be AEW. It's going to be Tony Khan, the, the pro wrestling fan that's going to get a chance to book him. I mean, this is all absolutely fascinating and um it's gonna be really fun to uh to see it play out okada's a great talent if for some reason you're watching this show and you are like who who's okada <laughs> why does why do you keep saying that name zach well the top new japan star and some matches that i would point you to are the following anything against kenny omega but especially the dominion match two out of three falls um i believe that was 2018 I think somebody checked me on that, but I believe it was 2018. Um, amazing match. I mean, storytelling is off the chart. The physicality is insane. The stakes are really high. It, there's a there's an English commentary version out there, so definitely go um, and check that out. I also would check out anything with Will Ospreay. Um, and there's also like a, a cool little, and it's kind of like a forgotten Cody match, but they wrestled each other on one of the first new Japan shows in the United States um, back in, I think that was 2017. Um, and you can check that out too. I believe that's on YouTube and I'll try to find it and drop it on the brass ring media um, Twitter page, brass ring underscore media. Um, so you guys can watch that, but that's another kind of really good match in a different environment um, that you can see Okada uh, do his thing. So that'd be my recommendation to you. Thanks to everybody who joined the show. It's been a blast. Second week here for Spotlight talking Okada today. Um, if you missed last week's show, big show just like this on Roman Reigns. And you can go back um, and check that out as well. I think you'll enjoy it. We are live 3 Eastern every single week right here. Um, tomorrow, 
we continue our live programming right here at Brass Ring Media with our flagship show at 3 Eastern with myself and Tyler Sage. We'll be talking a lot about AEW Dynamite and uh, the big appearance um, on Friday night with, uh, with The Rock and Roman Reigns together on SmackDown. We'll give that a little preview in addition to some AEW talk. And then tomorrow night, Robert Vrijhaus returns for Nocturnal Knockout, a really, a really fun show. I was up late, very late, <laughs> um, uh, you know, tuning into that, and uh, he's great. He has some good topics lined up, and, uh, you know, the, the chat in that show was just off the chart, just amazing, really fun. Um, so don't miss it. Nocturnal Knockout, 10 Eastern with Robert Vallejos. If you liked what we talked about here, you liked how we talked about it, um, Obviously, subscribe for free on YouTube and subscribe for free to Substack, but also consider becoming a Brass Ring Media member. I think you'll love it. Um, our members do, and they are fantastic, and we thank them. It's $4 a month. Um, gets you full access to the Brass Ring Media content all week long, and that's a special members-only podcast. That is all of our pay-per-view and PLE review shows. It's access to our Discord community where we talk wrestling, not on Twitter X. Ha! Elon Musk, um, and uh, and also full access to our written Substack newsletter um, that's updated every single day with new content from me, from Tyler Sage, and others. So check that out. I think you'll be really happy that you did. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to everybody who joined us in the chat today. David, Sean, Tracy, and everybody else, appreciate you, and we'll talk to you really, really soon. See ya.